Tom Hogendorn. He is located in the US um, and will start with his presentation. And I also welcome Mark Schuarez, an, a new member of the AVF, uh, so semiconductors, also located in Munich here, like me. And a warm welcome to Francis, uh, far away in Africa, Cameroon. A newcomer uh, to the topic of vertical farming, but very engaged and uh, a wonderful, inspiring member for the AVF. Thank you for being with us. And M Michael Meyerhofer uh, from IFCO Systems, um, a company uh, at the outskirts of, of Munich in Pulach uh, in the southern part. A wonderful company for logistics um, and uh, for sustainable logistics and he will also present us with some interesting insights into the company. So let's start, let's go into the details and uh, Luis, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Christine. Thank you very much. So Rafa, I mean, uh, we can maybe start with the videos and then I'll give a little bit of Yes, absolutely. First, welcome, first, welcome to everyone. And also, I encourage everyone to submit their questions to Q&A tab so we can ask all the panelists afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Ramin. Uh, I'm going to make it brief for everybody and try to add some information. Good afternoon and good morning, depending on what region of the world you are. Thank you, AVF, for this opportunity also for sharing information and knowledge. Thank you all for being here and your time, your interest. First of all, Hagendorn is one of the global solution providers for environmental controls and automation in indoor farming. We have been doing projects globally for many years in more than 85 countries in the world. We believe the systems, solutions, and technology have to be environmentally sustainable. That's what, just one of our core values. Ivo is our latest innovation and new product. We did not upgrade our former systems, but developed a new product from scratch based on the real needs of the growers and the available technologies. Another point that we think we can make a difference is flexibility. Flexibility is a state of mind and a core value within our organization. Our solutions are open to connect with other systems, offer multi protocols and are connected securely online. As an organization, we're open to integrate with other solutions and work in partnership with other companies. We will always be searching for a better yield, better quality, and higher profit for our customers. Our solutions are based on the principles of growing by plant empowerment. Growing by plant empowerment is always taking into account the plant's need with any type of environment. The needs of the plants are more relevant than the infrastructure. Once you have defined the needs, then you can work on the tools and infrastructure to improve. Based on the plant empowerment principles, we have developed tools to do and implement data-driven growing. No more decisions based on experience, but on data and facts. You have the capability of measuring the real impact of your decisions within your operation and simulating their future effects using prediction tools. With data-driven growing, we're aiming for an autonomous vertical farm. This is not the future anymore, but the present. It is a process that takes some time and resources, but it is completely achievable and feasible. Thank you all, uh, and see you at the Q&A for questions and comments. Thank you, Luis. Now I got the message that the videos were not shown correctly. So I'm going to sh show them again with the okay. video. Sorry. Thank you. No. Thank you.
What if there's a system that speaks the same language as crops and plants, that understands nature and connects to everything? It's time to grow smarter, to do more with less. It's time to analyze and improve. It's time to meet the future. Ready, set, grow. Life is all about balance. For instance, the perfect balance of sunlight, water, temperature, and human care to let healthy and safe vegetables grow. With state-of-the-art high-tech developments, Dutch horticulture is empowered to protect this balance as never before. Today, we use substrates, computer-steered climate-controlled and recirculating systems, bumblebees for pollination, and insects and mites for pest control. Plants are made highly productive and resistant for diseases, which means less chemicals are needed. Our energy efficiency is almost 90%, but we're not there yet. The world population keeps growing. Not everyone has access to a daily portion of vegetables. We believe that new technologies are revolutionary in providing fresh and healthy vegetables to all people in a sustainable way. That's why we keep exploring. With robots, data, artificial intelligence, genetics, and biology, Dutch horticulture becomes a more and more efficient industry. In the future, plants are made fit for robotic harvesting, and researchers find ways to fully replace what's left of the labor force. Local genetics are used for local products, which gives us better possibilities for nutrition, taste, and convenience. Ecological production and the reuse of materials helps us to save resources and maintain a minimum of waste in the production chain. The perfect balance between technology, genetics, and biology can make the difference in producing sufficient and safe fresh vegetables. This leads to our most important goal, providing access to qualitative fresh vegetables to consumers worldwide, everywhere, anytime. We're ready for it. What about you? Thank you so much. We're going to see Luis back here again uh, at our Q&A session at the end of the session. Next, we have a recorded presentation from Urban Park Solutions CEO, Tom Debuchet. Hello everyone, my name is Tom de Boucher, I'm the CEO of Urban Crop Solutions and today I'll talk about how Modulex can be a profitable plant factory for your application in your city. Uh, we see four drivers for a profitable vertical farm. Um, what we do is over the last six years we've built a portfolio of good plant growth recipes um, in indoor biology and we've translated it uh, we've translated the needs of the plants into the good technology to build a good uh, operational plant factory. What our customers do, obviously, is operate a plant factory 24-7 and then be very smart in going to market in essentially an FMCG market. And obviously, the promise is real. Uh, you get healthy and tasty greens 365 days a year. However, vertical farming is expensive. Uh, compare the cost of up to 2,750 euros per square meter of the harvest surface with greenhouse costs, that's less than half. And then obviously land, uh, how is that valued is a question mark. Also, there are some serious observations to make about electricity. We do believe that you need to use green electricity to operate the farm. Um, third point is the risks. Um, this is a, an operation where if you have a serious shutdown, you don't lose the production of the week or of the day. You can lose up to six or eight weeks uh, of production. 
And obviously, how does your total full cost compare with the retail prices in your region? We have an example uh, for our, our previous, our old container farm. It's a Farm Pro container. Uh, it features 69 uh, square meters of harvest surface in an existing 40 foot uh, shipping container. Uh, we have 25 running in three uh, different continents. Um, and here you see a complete uh, detailed full cost calculation based on a capex of 137,000 euro for a full container, which translate into just below 2,000 euro per square meter of harvest surface. Now, if you uh, calculate all the uh, line items with the staff, uh, European uh, skilled labor cost um, is fairly high, uh, electricity costs, water seed, CO2, then also including a 10-year depreciation of your investments, then you amount to 11.2 euro per kilogram of romaine lettuce. Don't worry, you can contact us, you can get all these spreadsheets uh, from us um, uh, and even from our website, uh, we offer a feasibility calculator. Now, 11.2 uh, euro per square meter, is that profitable? Well, look at some sample retail pricing. If you just compare Belgian prices here in Central Europe, five euro per kilogram, forget it. There's, there's, there's no way you can build a, a profitable business with that. If you look in US, Singapore, maybe you can get there if you account for your sales and admin, admin expenses. I have a second example for the same container farm where it's actually 19 euro per kilogram, including depreciation of your uh, investment. There, if you look at uh, retail price as well, if you look at New York, there is profitable business today uh, to be made with vertical farms. So that's why vertical farming today is only for niche markets and really driven by geography, I should say even climate. You know, in Singapore, people don't have space so they wanna go vertical. In the Middle East, there's no water. You can have a lot of water savings. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, Canada, uh, Scandinavia, there's no light, very short growing seasons. So their vertical farming could be a profitable uh, business model. Second, uh, we see people deploy vertical farms uh, driven by an innovative value chain. And this is our Farm Pro here on the parking lot of the IKEA in Malmö, Sweden. And there they've been testing our Farm Pro with a very simple idea. Why not grow the lettuce for our restaurant 50 meters away on the parking lot rather than shipping it over three days from southern Spain or from Portugal? So no matter what happens, to build this in this industry, we need to reduce our cost. The technology works, the biology works. Financially, it only works in certain niches. So we really worked hard at reducing the CAPEX, reducing OPEX, improving the yield, and the result is our module X growing module. Well, I'll show you a, a short video where you actually see that for the first time, we have, uh, for the first time in the industry, we've developed a bench carousel, which brings any bench in the grow module to you within 90 seconds. This is how you operate uh, the bench carousel. So the trays are in the gondolas and you take out the tray uh, for harvesting. Um, so this bench carousel allowed us to increase the growing surface from 69 square meters all the way up to 86 square meters in the same growing module for the same investment. So it improves by 25% right from the get-go. Obviously labor, the efficiency is there because any bench comes to you within 90 seconds. This is how uh, a module X8 uh, looks like. So in the center, you have an operating module and then uh, this sliding door has been opened. And here you see eight different uh, growing modules uh, with obviously an office up front. So you can see the modularity and the scalability of this concept fairly easily. So between what we used to do in selling the farm pro container farms in the past and large scale plant factories, we are now offering to the marketplace a new mid-scale solution uh, at a fairly attractive cost. 
Um, the fact that it's scalable uh, is shown in, in, in this small video where you start uh, with the module X8. Um, in the middle, you see this operation room uh, I talked about. Then uh, we're going to fly into the operation room. Uh, you'll see the doors open um, and you can see right into the benches of the bench carousel. We're sliding around and here you see the entry of the total solution. Uh, don't worry, you can see uh, all this uh, on our website. All these videos are available. Um, for this module X8, which has a CAPEX of only 1800 euro per growing square meter instead of 2000. Um, you see the same calculation for Romaine lettuce at only 8.7 euro per kilogram, which is an improvement of 23%. Now, there are plants that, unlike lettuce, which grows horizontally just as much as vertically, but that are growing very vertical like uh, a basil. Well, for a basil, you have the extra advantage of planting density, where we go from a gully to a bench and have the ability now to plant in a checkerboard pattern. So if you look at the financial effect of this, next to the 25% advantage of growing square meters, you also, you also have 24% advantage in planting density. The result is that from the 19.2 euro per kilogram for our first generation, we now go to a half cost of 9.6 euro per uh, kilogram or a 50% full cost reduction. Now, mind you, again, this is including a 10 year depreciation of your initial investment. So now at 9.6 euro per kilogram, is this profitable in your city? If it is, what you can do is start small, for instance, with a module X4 with four different growing modules. Then um, within the uh, same, using the same operating module in the middle, you can expand to a module X8. You can even expand the operations module and go to a 16, and then even adding a second floor, and all of a sudden you have a module X32. So this concept allows you to start up small, prove your business uh, business model, and then scale up very fast. Uh, what is fast? We're offering growing modules with a lead time X works of three months. So after order, three months later, the growing modules leave uh, our assembly factory. So what's next for vertical farming? Obviously, we're going to continue to work to improve both CAPEX and OPEX, but we believe that the next step change is going to come from the seed genetics. Obviously, we're working on this uh, a lot ourselves. We have, as you can see, our own uh, indoor biology research center, and we have made a complete 3D scan, which allows you to do an interactive virtual tour. For that, go to our website, www.urbancropsolutions.com. This is the, the insight, for instance, of uh, our uh, lab number eight. So let us stay in touch. Uh, if you have any questions, give me a call or send us a mail. We'll be happy to help you in your journey of vertical farming. Thank you. Thanks a lot to Tom. He's going to also join us for the Q&A session. Now I'm going to give the floor to Michelle Meyerhofer from IFCO Systems. Please, floor is yours. Can you can you hear me and see the, the slides? Yes, we can. Yeah, super. Thank you. Yeah, my, my name is Michael Meyerhofer, and um, yeah, I'm working with uh, IFCO since more than 10 years. 
in, in different roles. And um, currently I'm uh, responsible for the development of new areas uh, and new markets and uh, new, new products. Thank you to ABF and Christine that we have a chance today to, to present our company. Yeah, IFCO, uh, the name is, um, what, what is IFCO? It's uh, International Food Container Organization, uh, founded um, 1992 in, in the south of Munich. And the idea was um, to invent a reusable packaging solution for fresh produce. Uh, in the beginning, it was an idea, it was a small company. In the meantime, uh, IFCO has a global footprint um, we operate a pool of uh, more than 300 million reusable plastic containers. Um, we are serving uh, 14,000 uh, fresh produce um, uh, producers and suppliers uh, all over the world and uh, uh, serving uh, 320 retailers. We are a lean company, we have 1,100 employees operating uh, 89 service center, service center um, that means uh, this is our washing center where the, the, the crates will be washed after, after, after use. And um, yeah, and um, we are focusing on this reusable packaging. That means uh, we don't sell as our applications, if go only renting applications. And what is also important, all our crates are collapsible. That means we have a very efficient uh, reverse logistic when the crates um, have, been, have been used. Um, this is our operating model um, on, on one page. How does it work? So it means uh, if, if a grower or retailer make decision to use our reusable packaging solution instead of a carton box or one-way packaging solution, they order uh, the boxes um, with, with IFCO, we deliver the right application to the, uh, to the supplier. This can be a packing house or a growing ground, whatever. We have 10 different sizes of our crates. The grower packs the produce, the products in our crates, deliver to the retail distribution center. And the most of the retailer using our crates also for dis display purposes on the point of sale. Um, after, after the use, we collect um, the used crates um, in the distribution center, bring it back to our um, washing depot. That means we inspect, recollect, or repair the crates. Uh, cleaning, uh, it's a standardized cleaning process. And then the, the process starts uh, from, from you. That means we have a standardized washing process uh, all over the world. Why, what are the advantages? Um, um, sustainability is this what we are doing. Yeah? This means uh, IFCO is uh, doing circular economy since beginning of 1992. Uh, um, to be honest, some years ago, nobody was interested in sustainability. Today, it's, uh, uh, it's one of our uh, main, main messages, but uh, our crates have many, many more advantages. Yeah? Uh, you have, uh, compared with the cardboard box, a much, much better product, uh, product protection compared with, with cardboard, a better ventilation, better temperature control, which is very important for products, uh, sensitive products like banana, for example. And you have, uh, what is also very important for our customer, you have a, a cost reduction over the complete supply chain. Um, you have, um, you can save uh, uh, time, space, money with the one-touch solution because you can use from the production to the point of sales. And uh, it's, it's looking good. We are uh, um, offering different, different colors and it has a positive impact on the environment because we are using uh, polypropylene for the production of our crates. Um, only virgin material. Um, in average, you can use a crate for 10 years. Some crates are older until 15 years. And when the crate is broken or damaged, we granulate this crate and produce from the regrind 
in Ukraine. So it means it's a it's a closed it's a closed system. <clears throat> um, I mentioned the, the product protection. This is very important, especially when you have a long distance. When you, when you when a, for example a retailer from the north of Europe uh, importing uh, tomatoes from Sicily, for example, it's it's a long journey. And here we have uh, compared with one one way packaging uh, a big advantage of the damage rates. That means our sturdy uh, design of the crates protect um, the, the sensitive produce over the complete transport journey. And when you see only from uh, the damage rate from producer to retailer, the zero with our RPC, and uh, it's in average 20% with a disposal packaging that means with a, with a, cardboard, with a cardboard box. <clears throat> this is um, due to the better ventilation of our, uh, of our crate design compared with the cardboard box. Um, this is an example for, for banana. Banana, very sensitive product, very long journey from Latin America to, to Europe or North America, for example. Um, it's very important that in the container, uh, the banana cools down to, a, to a, a temperature below 14 degrees because then the banana stops growing. And uh, you can achieve this uh, temperature with our with our banana crate compared to the cardboard box, uh, one third quicker, and you have a more consistent um, uh, temperature during the transport uh, compared to the cardboard box. It means uh, in the end, you when the banana comes here, arrives in Europe, you have a younger product, a better product, and this has a big impact on the store life uh, in, the, in the retail store. Mm -hmm. Overall, uh, our crates have a positive, uh, positive impact uh, on the environment, what, what I have mentioned. Uh, what we are doing is circular economy um, in the core because uh, you can reuse our packaging again, 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 again. And this has a positive impact on the, on the, on the product damage. We can reduce it with, with our crates by uh, 96%. We have up to 60% less CO2 emissions. You produce less weight because you can use the application again, again, again. You need less energy, energy to produce new crates. And this has also very positive impact on the, on the water consumption. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this is uh, one of the last uh, charts what is becoming more and more important in the last year is the sanitation process. So it means um, we are washing or sanitize every single crate after the use. And uh, hygiene, not only in fresh produce uh, industry, also in the adjacent market, Markets like bread or, um, or meat industry is a more and more important topic. What we are able to, to fulfill and uh, that we are able to, to meet all the requirements for, uh, on these uh, different supply chains. <clears throat> so that means um, IFCO is uh, growing since, uh, since uh, 30 years and um, there are many, many reasons for, as I mentioned before, the environmental, positive environmental impact is uh, one of the top topics uh, currently, but what is also important for, for the decision maker is that they save money with, with our system because you have no capital investment, no depreciation, and they only pay for one use, for one trip, only what they're paying, only for what they are using. Mm, they save time, uh, they save space. That means no storage is required. We have a, a just-in-time delivery um, all over the world. 
and we're covering every single peak. Yeah, that means high season peaks in, in Christmas or uh, Easter and so on and so on. And um, yeah, again, this has also um, the reusable aspect has a very positive impact on, uh, on the natural resources and on the environment. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna see you back uh, for the Q&A session. Now I'm gonna show you some videos from iFarm and then we're gonna see the presentation by Karin Zelensky, the CEO of iFarm.
April. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ramin. Thanks, thanks Christine and, and whole associations of vertical farming. My, my proud to be part of it. I'm, I will try to share my screen right now and tell you a little bit more about iFarm. Okay, I hope you can you can see my screen right now. Uh, so what am I doing is uh, technology to uh, to grow food indoors. What is it? So it's, somehow it's working not correct. Okay, now it's it's it works. So what am I trying to do? First of all, it's it's software. Our software is can can be embedded in any farm. It can be vertical farms first of all, but also for traditional greenhouses. And uh, our software allows users to use farms like personal computers, like you opening computers and just you know opening browser and going to internet. You even don't. And then uh, flexible to to take local local ones, which is uh, always always better. And then my supplying after after my build a farm, my also supplying our software again, and also my supplying seeds and fertilizers and everything because we know exactly which ones are better. My testing my testing a lot of them, and we know how they're growing. And our software is iFarm Grow Tune. It's exactly the tools which knows how crops are growing. We have own laboratories in, in several countries. We are testing uh, constantly and we have our safe learning system system to, to grow it. And you have seen drones, we are using them also for, uh, let's say, for understanding what happens with crops and same time for saving costs because one drone is flying around farm in 500 square meters. It's just saving us uh, about 800 hours of people work per month by doing pictures and then recognizing what happens and if something should be adjusted in farms. And we understand now already more than 120 unique unique different crops. So it's leafy greens, berries, flowers, medical herbs and everything. And we're even trying to grow things like vanilla, stevia and wasabi in, inside our farms. I'm not telling about, about normal salads and and uh, tomatoes. So farm our our own farms looks like this. So it's a real farm which which we have done in in Russia in Siberia in very very cold uh, region or or there is croppers or we can do it like like in restaurants or or supermarkets it can be put it under glass wall and and be very very nice and also same time it will supply supply very very fresh and local greens to to customers or this this one kitchen size my team, uh, my still small company, but my growing very fast. My three years old, and my team of 80, 80 people in six countries now, and growing, growing very rapidly. But all those people are very, very experienced in 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 exactly needed. Um, fields. So I have people from software development, from agriculture, from business, and from construction. And uh, everything what we are doing, it's, you know, everyone understand it. it. It has huge environmental impact. Already last year, we produced a lot of food and we're reducing CO2 emission because food is not traveling. And also our food is, is, 
eating CO2, let's say, crops while growing and may are producing oxygen and may not, may not producing any kind of greenhouse effect because, because uh, may, may have a very unique system of, of uh, air circulation. And also it's full economy because food is not delivered anymore in, in, and, and of course water and land, land saved and it will be even more effect. And now we are already providing our technology to to uh, to customers and also working with some partners uh, and it's 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 very good to know that just yesterday we announced cooperation with logics and esi and we're happy to do that and we will continue definitely so and we're inviting everyone to work with us together and there is our contacts and i will be happy to answer questions later and thanks again uh, Association of Vertical Farming for inviting us. Thanks, Ramin, for this possibility. And my open for, for next stage. Thanks. Thank you so much. And now we have the last presentation of the first sec uh, section of the uh, webinar, which is Emil Dreza, the president of Agriculture from Canada. Please, the floor is yours, Emil. Hello everyone, thanks for uh, having us here. Um, my name is Emil Brezza and I am uh, president of Agriculture Advancements. And uh, a little bit about us, what do we do? So we have a unique approach to uh, climatic design and engineering. We, uh, we strive to maximize facility production of indoor farms while minimizing energy inputs. Our plant first approach uh, involves improving crop production and beginning with the understanding of the specific requirements of each plant. We then design our components with full consideration of the, uh, of the plant's biological needs to match energy. And we also exploit uh, synergies in, uh, in energy management to minimize operational expenditures, such as using the same light signaling inputs to, that improve taste texture and potency via UVB, while at the same time, those same inputs uh, help reduce the need for chemical pathogens and pest intervention. We then capture the waste heat produced by those very lights and use that waste heat to actually reduce the, uh, the amount of uh, energy and the size of the chiller plant required to provide the cooling and the uh, temperature and uh, humidity control. So uh, we have, uh, sorry, we have uh, four areas of, uh, of expertise and uh, starting with uh, photobiology, we, uh, we specialize in combining deep UV with visible light in multi-channel fixtures, which stimulate the secondary metabolic pathways in, in plants. This helps to maximize and steer chemical expression of the plants and improve taste, smell, texture, potency, as well as control mold and pests to improve yield and reduce the cost of chemical intervention and, and uh, the damage from mold. And we create unique expressions of common genetics. And how do you differentiate yourself in the marketplace is uh, really important. You can pay a lot of dollars for marketing campaigns, or you can simply make your product different. And that's the, uh, that's the approach that, uh, that we believe in. We also excel in system design and engineering. We, uh, we strive to make all our components adaptable, modular, and scalable to fit almost uh, any type of legacy CEA environment and application. Uh, we love to be challenged and um, we, uh, we strive to uh, be able to deliver. And through our flexibility and modularity and adaptability, we can put our ample platform into almost any application. And you see here on the screen, uh, we were challenged to, uh, to come up with a design that we would actually be able to integrate in with an aquaponic system. And uh, not only were we able to do that, but we actually were able to create a multi-level version of it. Another area of expertise that we have is computational fluid dynamic modeling. 
it is a seldom used tool that everybody should be using. And uh, we, we, why build your facility to find out there is a problem when you can look at the various stages of your design and, and run very accurate models that will identify and predict problems. You can validate your, your designs and systems before you spend a lot of money. And uh, you can see an example here where somebody paid a lot of money to have a facility designed and built. And uh, in the end, it was uh, a, very, um, a very poor design that was gonna lead to a lot of uh, plant problems. And you can, if you look at the screen closely, you can see that as the air was coming through, it uh, hit some restrictions at the front of each row and actually pulled air back out of the plant canopy from the layers above, which were bypassing all the cooling that was supposed to be being delivered. Controlled environment agriculture is, is what everything comes down to in, in our expertise. We, um, through, this, uh, through this level of, uh, of, of our uh, approach, we, we develop what we call the, the plant first approach, which develops complete control of every cell along an entire row length. It, you, it facilitates independent control of each layer independent from any other layer in a room or any layer. And this uh, gives incredible uh, flexibility for operators to balance the needs of their facility to meet their market requirements. So through those areas of expertise, we led to the development of the Ample platform. We don't rely on bulk air treatment we bring the ample brings the microcontrol to each layer of every row. It supplies precisely treated air upward through the plant canopy, and it removes the byproducts of photosynthesis at the source, the plants and the lights. This allows unprecedented control of crop dynamics and production. We size every microcoil to the specific plant being grown, and we can customize row widths and layer heights to suit. The benefits of the, of the Ample platform are flexibility, scalability, modularity, precise control over each cell's microenvironment. The key to achieving that is, is the adjustable nozzles that we develop, where along the entire row length, you can balance the, uh, the CFM flow through the entire uh, length of the production bed and it, it ensures constant and, and similar CFM at any cell along that entire length. And uh, without, without that adjustability, it's, uh, it's very likely that uh, you'll have unbalanced airflow from one end of a row down to the other end of a row. This also allows for different uh, genetics in, in, the same, uh, in the same room or even in, um, in the same rack if if the need arises, where each layer of every row can have a different set point and environmental condition. So heat recovery is another huge benefit of the Ample platform, where we capture the heat produced by the lights, and again, use that to reduce the actual size of the chiller plant that would be required to provide the cooling from those lights. And in various projects we've been involved in, we've been able to reduce the plant between 20 to 30 percent and this translates into a 30 percent reduction in your opex expenditures as well which goes right to your bottom line so and we optimize ergonomics of the workflow we we our approach is to use a back-to-back -back layout which maximizes the row length without the need for constantly moving racks or the complexity and cost of moving racks our grow troughs were designed to be able to slide in and out of any aisle side of the unit into a work platform or out into the row where the, uh, the employees can have easy access and work in an upright position, minimizing worker fatigue and helping to improve overall efficiency. Our designs are focused on on uh, ascending airflow right from nozzle to the return duct. 
This provides optimal air pass. It minimizes boundary layers around plants. It increases respiration and root uptake. Stale air is actively removed from above the plant canopy. And by minimizing the distance between the lights and return ducts, this creates an active cooling effect from our passively cooled and our lights at no cost and no risk to the luminaire. Why build a facility and then see if your design, your SOPs and assumptions work? We believe in, in starting with the most basic unit and scaling up. This provides huge advantages for uh, developing a, a, a food factory or a facility. You can, you can uh, at a very extremely low cost, you can develop all your SOPs. You can work out your genetic selections. You can optimize your set points for those very genetics. And you can have fully trained employees on a very small scalable platform. This allows you to develop your market at a much smaller scale in cost and, and just add units as you grow. And these units can be placed into any space that you can find at any time. There's, there's usually lots of um, warehouse space that, that's available. And because we bring the, the chiller plant and the uh, HVAC system right to the, the ample units, there's no need to engineer costly facility scale um, HVAC uh, units and, and capacity at the start of your project. So you can see, starting from the most basic unit, which comes with a, a portable chiller system, fluid cooler, and pump skids to support that unit, you can trial all those benefits that we talked about, and then scale a row at a time, a room at a time, or right through to a, a full-size facility. Currently, we have uh, three installations underway, uh, underway at various uh, scales from the, the smallest unit, which is being used by an academic institution, right through to a full-size medical grade cannabis facility that is going to be built out in, in um, stages with uh, rooms at a time. And finally, it allows for facility optimization. So we have complete turnkey designs with all the uh, uh, various components linked together with full controllability. So frame, chiller, HVAC, nozzles, airflow, multi-channel lighting, irrigation, all integrated with, with the control system. This control system then easily integrates with a facility level control system, but it also allows for redundancy in the case of a power outage or if you lose internet control. And this also allows for um, multiple stages of backup strategies if you lose power. Certain parts of the system can be uh, scaled back, can be shut off, shut down. Multi-channel lights can go to one channel. Chiller modules can be scaled back to one or two modules that allow for critical um, cooling. You can raise set points, temperatures, humidities, and and still um, function and stay within BPP targets of the crops that you're growing. And finally, we have auxiliary heat streams that can be further utilized within the facility. For instance, wash stations, domestic hot water, cafeteria, showers. And in those parts of the world where we all have to shovel snow, it also can provide space heat in the wintertime. So I'd like to thank ADF and Raman for inviting us to speak. And please, everyone, stay in touch and reach out if you have any questions uh, or need any kind of uh, engineering services. You can be reached at the contact information right there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your great presentation. And this concludes our first set of the presentations. And now I invite Kristen zimmerman Losel, our chairwoman, to conduct the discussion and Q&A session. Please, Kristen. Wow, I'm, I'm thrilled really to listen to all these excellent uh, presentations. 
thank you to all of you. Um, I, I won't uh, call you now by name because that would take too much of our time. But thanks a lot. Um, we have heard about uh, logistics. We have uh, heard about software and modular systems in different um, in, in different uh, constellations. And, and that is really uh, what brings uh, AVF together uh, as a platform, but as a network as well, uh, to learn about what is out there, what is existing, uh, and, and then uh, to create collaboration and cooperation, but also to create knowledge um, and, and a better understanding where are the pinpoints and how can we accelerate vertical farming. And my question uh, to, to Luis, because you started um, uh, the presentations, Hogendorn is, is a well-established company. And uh, what do you see as the next step for you as the company and vertical farming? Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, we definitely see all this autonomous uh, solutions running uh, that give the possibility of uh, working with less labor intensive operations mm -hmm. and uh, doesn't mean that we're gonna let's say not need uh, labor and, and talent and experience yes it, it's needed but it's a complementary solution to be capable of scale up uh, scalable solutions and look for uh, return of investment maybe in a shorter time and make this more feasible yeah. okay um yeah i can totally share that um and i, I think tom uh, with your presentation you also see the need uh, or expressed uh, the need for hello tom uh, for more yeah. automation and uh, especially the the modular design uh, what, what would be your um, next steps um, and what do you see for your company, but also for the vertical farming industry as a whole? Well, obviously for the last six years, we've been trying to sell large scale plant factories in existing buildings. That's what you see on the internet the most. That's also where the big investments go. And that really makes sense if today you're a Walmart or an Albert Heijn and you know exactly what kind of crop you need, which specification, what's the seasonality, what price do I buy, et cetera, et cetera. However, 80% of the people that we got in over the last couple of years are new entrants. And they see a lot of future, a lot of potential in this sustainable technology, of course, within a certain region. But they know, don't know where they're going to end up a year or two years from now. Mm -hmm. So we've centered our thinking about cost reduction in CAPEX, and we've, do, we've done that by maximizing the number of harvest uh, square meters within one grow module. And second, we've developed something where you can start up fast and then prove your business plan and then scale up later. Um, so the next step for us is obviously we're going to be continue to try to improve our, our systems. This is still you know, this is still a very uh, emerging market where big step changes still are possible. Yes. Uh, but I think uh, the big step change that is going to come is from people like Unfold and others that are now going to take their entire database of genetics and really optimize for growing under lead light, mm -hmm. where uh, you don't really don't care too much about disease resistance, but you want maximum response to a minimum amount of incoming light, mm -hmm. where for the last couple of decades, they've basically done the reverse for growing under sunshine. Um, and, and there I'm hearing that fairly fast and that's within maybe two, three years, uh, we could expect yield improvements of 30%. And, and, and that's gonna be a breakthrough. Um, I mean, the 9.2 Euro kilogram I just talked about, all of a sudden becomes six uh, and there, for Genovese Basil, you're going to be competitive anywhere in the world. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, interesting. So um, the genetics and uh, seeds, which are um, for indoor farming, um, who, who is sharing that view from Tom, that this is the next step in vertical farming? Hands up. <laughs> 
What about you, uh, Kirill? Is that uh, something you see in your uh, company's uh, strategy? Okay, he probably can't hear me. Can you hear me, Kirill? No. Okay. Uh, Mark, uh, you are new in, in the field uh, to vertical farming. Is, is that um, a knowledge uh, you are already embracing that the LED lights uh, will be optimized again then to a different um, generation of seeds? This is a good question. So yeah, until now there is a still a big debate uh, what kind of LED light is best for each plant and some people trying some uh, recipes to optimize the energy. Uh, still a big debate because uh, a lot of research has to be done. So I, I don't have any, any idea of these um, seeds, these new seeds, frankly speaking, but we work with several uh, research centers Mm -hmm. uh, and they try our lights and our new technologies and many combinations of them from UV to infrared. So they, they work with all these uh, broad range and adapting and changing them. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a long way to go still. Mm -hmm. And the light is a big part of it and the LEDs especially. Because what I see is that from all the projects and all the, the people uh, explaining the main issue is the energy cost, right? At the end to reach to reach this point that the market is accepting the prices from vertical farms. So a lot to a lot to do there. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, yeah. Emil, uh, uh, it's the first time uh, I was listening and, and seeing a, um, uh, w one of your presentation and, and that's really a, a stunning uh, and, and very engineering and scientific approach. Um, since when are you in, in the market and uh, where are your um, focus uh, markets? Hi, Christine. So yeah, thanks. Um, we, uh, we've been in the marketplace now for about four years. Uh, we went through a name change. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, you, you, you come up with a name and then you realize uh, you get drowned out by the 10,000 other companies that have a similar uh, name or word in your, in your uh, title. And of course, uh, we had to come up with uh, a novel uh, name once again. And, and we settled on agriculture advancements, which gets rid of all the um, noise uh, uh, surrounded the name. Now, uh, our focus has always been research. Uh, we started with research um, and we have an existing um, academic uh, partnership with uh, Ryerson University, both in the mechanical uh, department and in the uh, biology department, where uh, Ryerson was uh, the first university to introduce uh, medical cannabis research into uh, a university in Canada. And we have been actively partnered with them since. And our, um, our focus is uh, on high value crops right now. Um, there's a lot of competition in the, uh, in the lettuce factories uh, around the world. And so we, we look at uh, novel approaches to grow crops that typically are not grown uh, indoors right now and adapt our system to those types of plants. So um, okay. of course, globally, uh, cannabis has been the low hanging fruit where they can afford uh, higher cost inputs uh, from a capex standpoint but they also very much strive to reduce opex and um, through that um, uh, marketplace we developed a lot of the technologies that i did speak about where we capture and reuse energy that that typically otherwise is just thrown out uh, the window it's it's sent outside into the environment but we find ways to reuse it uh, i can't talk enough about the heat recovery and using lights uh, for multiple purposes. So you want to stimulate genetic expression, but at the same time, you get secondary uh, benefits for, for free. So with UVB, you can tailor the plant's expression. You can um, create a unique version of those expressions, not unlike uh, wine around the world. Uh, there's a reason that, you know, you have um, uh, the same crop grown, or for instance, Cabernet, in six different places in the world and they each have a different 
expression. And I believe, uh, and our partners believe that you can, that can translate into the crop world, uh, especially with cannabis. It's a very complex plant and it has a lot of metabolic pathways. And we strive to be able to stimulate those. And then of course, energy, 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 energy recovery, energy reuse and repurposing. That, that's our focus. Yeah. Yeah. And cannabis has always helped the indoor food industry to, to grow uh, because this is the industry which enables uh, uh, the high costs in, in the very beginning. So, exactly. Yeah. Yes. And that is what, what we are thankful <laughs> about. Um, do you share uh, Tom's view that uh, companies like Unfold who look into uh, new seeds and the genetics uh, will, will be the next step for vertical farming? Yes, and, and it's uh, a, a need for that. A lot of the crops that are grown right now were, were developed either outdoors and then um, they were refined for greenhouse uh, applications. And there are differences when you come indoors, uh, plants don't behave exactly as they do when they're outside and or in a, in a greenhouse. So it is going to still take some time. And I think it's great that, that people are working on specific genetics for indoor vertical farming. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So we have heard a lot about technology. Vertical farming is not only a growing technology and HVAC and, and software. It is like we've heard from Michael Meyerhofer from IFCO, um, also about logistics and the sustainability before and after the, the production. And this is what we would like to emphasize also and to, um, to show um, to, to everybody that the whole food chain is interesting for us. Michael, uh, so IFCO has joined AVF, I think already last year or two years ago, um, what, how do you see your role in vertical farming? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this, this is uh, new. It's my first uh, time that I attend yeah, so. <laughs> your conference. But yeah. I think it's, um, in the end, it's a very sustainable uh, solution for good use, uh, fresh produce. And uh, um, I think the, the main factor is that you have... Uh, when it's on the, on the right location, on the right place, you have very uh, low or very small distances to, to, to the customer. Yeah? And uh, this is, um, I hopefully you, you, uh, you will need uh, IFCO RPCs uh, for sure, but maybe for, for, for a, a lower, a smaller distance. And I think this, this is, uh, a very good way to 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 save energy and give a, a, a good uh, impact on uh, on the environment yeah because it make it make no sense when you when you import and travel fresh produce around the world yeah because this is not really really sustainable and this is in an rpc or in a, or in a in a carton box yeah and so um, yeah, I think it's very, it's very exciting it's, uh, to hear and it's very interesting for me to learn uh, what the developments are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And thanks a lot, uh, Michelle. And, and uh, this is really uh, one aim uh, AVF has, uh, that we gather um, in our network uh, companies, really from production up to the consumer side, uh, to show also the retailers to present that there is a new approach, uh, a new food chain building up. Mm. Yeah, and maybe, then... maybe, maybe one content. And we see here uh, uh, a new thinking also on retail side. You know, in, in the past, I'm, I'm in this business in more than 20 years and acting with retailers. Uh, the price is very important yeah, due to the high competition all over the world. But uh, sustainability is also a very important factor uh, in the meantime. And, uh, um, and we're seeing a trend that, you know, IFCO is uh, um, producing this RPC for, for mainly for in the last 30 years for, for transportation of fresh produce. And we have more and more requirements uh, from retail and from suppliers um, 
for dedicated applications for very special items like banana. Yeah, we, we are currently developing uh, application for banana to, to make sure a very uh, safe travel, perfect ventilation and protection of this, uh, uh, of this um, uh, item over the complete supply chain. And more and more requests for other for applications for other uh, adjacent fresh categories. Yeah, that means bread, meat, uh, and dairy products, and so on, and so on. And this is what I want to say. What I uh, uh, see is a different thinking, and that uh, although the retailers are looking for a sustainable solution over the complete supply chain. Yeah, and. Uh, and also driven higher requirements on hygiene, uh, higher degree of automation yeah, in, in, in production and in the, in the disease picking systems and so on and so on. Yeah. 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 I think that knowledge, uh, that direct and, and long term experience with retailers you have could really benefit a lot of the technology mm -hmm. providers and uh, the, the ones who are uh, building uh, business models in vertical yeah, yeah, yeah. farming. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to bring into the discussion my uh, colleague, uh, the vice chair of the Association for Vertical Farming, Joel Coelho in Arizona, because he also has some questions to our panelists. Uh, so, Joel, please go ahead. Thank you, Christine. I just have uh, two quick questions, one for Tom and one for Michelle. Um, Michelle, since you're already uh, speaking here, uh, just a quick question. Can you please uh, uh, elaborate a little bit as to why your container or your crates have the capacity for better cooling compared with conventional uh, containers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when we design uh, uh, RPC, a reusable container, this is... Um, this is um, due to the requirements of the dimension. And, um, but this is for dedicated items in the fresh, uh, fresh produce uh, assortment. That means, for example, uh, it's a new development. This is the reason why I'm talking, I like to talk about this, this special application for bananas. Yeah? And for bananas, uh, you know, the, the bananas coming to Europe or North America, and then they um, going through a uh, ripening, uh, ripening time of five days in a ripening chamber, yeah? And here, it's very, very uh, important that you have a uniform coloration of the bananas after the ripening process. This is a requirement from the consumer. Right. And uh, we thought about how can we optimize the circulation of the ripening gas during this ripening cycle. That means we have designed uh, um, an application was this optimized on the requirements of this specific items. In this example, the banana. And this is what we are trying to do with other categories and other items. That means to optimize okay. the design to support a better, um, yeah, a better cooling, better ventilation, and to increase the lifespan of the product. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Uh, one last quick question yeah, for you. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the lifespan of your container on average is around 15 years. Yeah, 10, so, 10 to 15 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so, yeah. so what do you do uh, once uh, it reaches its, uh, you know, its uh, due date or its final date? Uh, do you recycle the, the material? You're right, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we are using, uh, we, we produce all of our containers uh, from polypropylene, from yes. virgin material. And this propylene, the, the reason why we are using this, you can re-grind uh, when you have a broken RPC. Okay. You can granulate this and you can produce again and again and again a new RPC. That, that is great. And, and that yeah. was wonderful uh, in terms of uh, fostering sustainability in the retail uh, sector of the vertical farming industry. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tom, I got a question for you. I really appreciate your very holistic uh, approach uh, to uh, the vertical farming industry and, and business. So I'm presuming that you are working very closely with your customers uh, in working out their economics and you can comment on that. But my first question is, 
is there already an existing uh, model uh, that you have with that is commercially operating with two stacks or two levels of your uh, modular containers? No, there's not. Um, we okay. actually this module X is our second generation. We have 25 uh, running today in okay. three different continents. Uh -huh. um, and uh, we're now delivering actually our first one to Sweden. Um, I think we're a bit away from, from putting or stacking them uh, on top. However, we've designed especially the outdoor unit of our climate system to, to enable the stacking. Okay, all right. So uh, at what point would it make sense for a vertical farming company uh, to get to that second level? Um, if you go on our website on, on the module X page, it explains you all the features and benefits. Right. And, and we try to be transparent because, you know, I came into this industry two years ago. Yeah. Uh, I've been in three other industries in my career. Yeah. And this has been the longest, most strenuous learning curve I have ever had. Yeah. And I said, look, you know, if, if we're talking to leads and potential partners, they need to understand very quickly whether vertical farming makes sense for their application. Right, their right. So you can actually click and ask for the free feasibility calculator where uh, linked to our crop, crop guide, where we have 220 yield numbers in kilogram of output uh, per square meter per year uh, with your cost. So the labor electricity in your city uh, right. with your crop mix, um, we can actually calculate, uh, you know, will you, will you turn a margin, right? Yeah. Uh, and we offer this for free. So in just one evening, uh, if you have, obviously, if you have all the data and the information, you know, you can very quickly uh, figure out if in your city, vertical farming makes sense financially. That, that is really great. I, I think we should <laughs> promote that because that's a, a quick calculator uh, for everyone to use. Exactly. Uh, and, and, yes. and the price list is, is straight on our website. You know what you're going to pay for a Module X2 all the way up to a Module X32, so with 32 modules. Uh -huh. So we want to take the guesswork out of it, hard facts, hard figures. Yeah. It is difficult to make a profit with this technology. It yeah, still yeah. is early stage. It's extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of countries, I'm sorry, you cannot compete with greenhouses and traditional over right, air right. So my last question for you is related to that. I'm sure you've done this in your research. So by your count, how many countries on earth today are able to, uh, to foster a commercially feasible vertical farming enterprise? Uh, depending on the crop, depending yes. on the value chain, Correct. depending on uh, the application, uh -huh. every country or no country. All right. So, okay. <laughs> you know, what do you want to do? Which crop do you want to grow? How do you want to sell yep. it? At which price can you sell it? Are you selling yeah, yeah. it, you know, to Walmart or are you selling it to a high-end restaurant? Correct, correct, correct. Right. Yes. Uh, what's your entire value chain? Can you cut out the uh, a wholesaler? Right. I'm right. sorry. It depends. You need and to your calculator can help out. answer that question. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, great. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciated, by the way, all of the presentations. All of the presentations were very informative. Thank you. Back to you, Christine. You're on mute, Christine. So sorry, <laughs> I repeat that. Okay, we will be closing this session now because we already run for the next one. We have a five minutes break uh, till the next presentations and the next Q&A is coming. Thank you so much for the presenters and for the discussion and also for the interest of the audience. It was great having you and keep, keep uh, on listening. We will be uh, on in five minutes again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Christine. Thank you. Bye bye. Welcome back, everyone. Now we're going to start the second set of presentations and afterwards another QA session. Uh, first, we have Rebecca Nording, the Global Marketing Director of Heliospectra, an LED producer company based in Sweden. Please, the floor is yours, Rebecca. 
Thank you, Ramin. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rebecca Norton, and I am, as Ramin said, the Global Marketing Director and Head of IR at Heliospectra. Uh, we are all here. I hope that everyone sees my screen now and my presentation. Yes. So Helios Becker is a global leader in innovating horticulture lightning technology controls and services uh, with the motto of redefining nature's potential. We started in 2006 by plants, uh, scientists and biologists to really make horticulture production more sustainable and resource efficient. Today, we have installations in uh, seven continents, including a research installation in Antarctica. And we have a head office or our head office in Sweden with other offices in Canada, US and uh, Japan. Since we started 15 years ago, we have conducted more than a thousand light spectrum tests and a hundred in-house research studies, giving us a very deep knowledge in LED lightning and how light affect crop production. But I thought I also gave a little bit of background on what are the issues that Heliospectra is focusing on and how the environment looks like today. So we are increasing, uh, our, sorry, uh, an increasing uh, population of estimated 9.7 billion in 2050 requires a huge amount of food, a 70% increase in food production in the next coming years. However, the amount of arable land do not increase the same growth uh, at the same time as the food production does. Further, we see an increase in urbanization with nearly 70% of world population living in urban areas by 2050. However, many countries today are uh, heavily dependent on import and uh, 700 million metric tons were moved when it comes to fresh vegetables in 2017. For countries in the Northern hemisphere, a lot of the time during the year, it's not impossible or it's impossible to grow outdoors. So the import becomes even more uh, important. And people are advocating both food security as well as um, decrease in emissions. We also see uh, an increase in sustainability, uh, sustainability that's driving demand today. Uh, nearly 70% of all consumers consider sustainability when making a purchase decision. So the demand for locally produced and ecological food has increased these couple of years with vertical farming becoming more and more relevant. It has a number of different benefits. It's very resource efficient and the ability to control the resources give the potential to save up to 98% of water use. Further, the use of abandoned, for example, local buildings due to the fact that uh, sorry, vertical farming is grown indoors, it frees up land that would otherwise not be used for growing food. The indoor environment also allows us to grow food 365 days a year and grow in close proximity of where people live, so delivery time shorten. It also allows us to grow in the most harsh environments in the harshest environment countries in the world. But let's take one step back and just look at why light is important. And because growing in a vertical farm, um, you're looking at indoor growth. And plant use lights for both as a source of energy and as a source of information about the environment. The spectrum therefore heavily influences plant development and provides plant with energy for growth. So heliospectra, when we're looking at providing light for an environment, we see that people are often looking at, for example, the intensity of a light or a specific wavelength. But when you're looking at 
uh, the light for a grow environment, it's important to look at both the light quantity, the light quality, and the light duration your specific crop need. So if, if you're looking at uh, the different wavelengths in a spectrum, they all have different effect of a crop. Blue light, for example, can uh, make a compact vegetative growth. Green light promotes more uh, or prevent abnormal development, such as poor coloration and texture, for example. Red light helps biomass accumulation and far red extension growth. But it's important to understand that the ratios of these different wavelengths in the spectrum will make the results of your crop. As an example, you can see this crop has all been grown with the same, uh, in the same environment with the only difference is the different spectrum. So in a sole source lightning environment, it's a vertical growth. It's increasingly important with light quality. And it's very important to look at your grower specific goals. What crop do you supposed to grow? At what stage will you grow it? We're looking at what type of growth environment you're doing it in and the desired outcomes you're actually looking to have. Because are you actually looking to grow faster? Are you looking to have a specific taste for the region that you're supplying the goods for? Are you looking to affect the color at the end of production, for example? Or do you want a taller crop to fit a specific uh, packaging, for example? All these goals are important to understand before you decide on what type of light you want. So these are examples how we have been working uh, to reach different goals using light. For example, here are uh, different high blue ratios and how the different amount of blue can affect uh, growth results. For example, you can use uh, blue or induce the red color in your lettuce at the end of production using a blue light, for example, in a vertical environment. You can look at affecting the taste of the crop. So for a full production with high blue, you can get a spicier taste in argula and mustard, for example. You can look at a full production cycle and you can there look at how you can maintain a more compact growth for example, in your specific crop. So having light as a tool, that's how we see it, as a really light uh, strategy to reach the different goals that you have. So when we are working with our growers, we always look at the crop in focus, reaching that quality crop to the goal that you're looking at, finding the intensity needed the, the light quantity, the light quality in the spectrum that you need, and the duration. And when you find these, you're looking at a lot of different positive results. You're looking at increasing your yield in your facility. We can accelerate the harvest of your production so you can grow more during the uh, cycle of a year, basically. You can improve your quality, which means you also receive less waste in your environment or growth facility. And what's specific to us using our control system, you can also help control consistency of that growth. You can save the different lighting strategies that you're using to make sure that that type of crop will have the same results every time. Furthermore, you can also make sure that you get the amount of produce you need to deliver at that specific moment as well. Today, we're looking at four different segments that we're working with commercial greenhouses, indoor facilities, and itself, both for vertical environments and as pop lighting in commercial greenhouses. We are combining them with a light control system, which is HelioCore, our control system, and sensors in the greenhouse. And for this, we are controlling uh, the light to make sure that each crop has a, the optimum amount of light quality when they need it and the night light quantity when they need it. Furthermore, the third part of our offering is our Helio Care Specialist. 
So we have expert consultants in-house with deep knowledge about different crops that helps to set out the perfect lighting strategy for your individual growth installation. So the three pillars are, of course, looking a bit closer on our lights. We have both uh, fixed spectrum lights with optimum growth or spectrum. We have controllable lights working with our Helio core system. And we have vertical solutions in type of light bars. The Helio core system that we have uh, are offering growers an increased amount of control. You can forecast production. You can look at your yield. You can really maximize the growth of your crop. You can look at optimizing different light zones and grouping so you can have different strategy throughout your growth facility. You can save money by using your light only when the electricity is as cheapest and they always save money. And you can also monitor your growth facility, making sure that all your lights are running as they should for complete control. We're looking at our Helio Care. We offer uh, light planning solutions to optimize the light spread, open site services and trials, cultivation training and different use of labs. So we can set a specific lighting strategy for you before you even decide on what type of spectrum or light that you're looking at. Our Helio Core uh, system, when you're looking at it from a vertical angle, uh, we have a terrific uh, schedule function basically. So for example, I think a lot of people looking at uh, vertical farms, they often look at light bars, but we also have customer using, for example, our Elixir, which is a fully controllable LED light where you can fine tune each and every single wavelength. Here, the schedule function is extremely powerful because in that way you can start looking at what type of taste, what type of, how do I want my crop to look like? And you can find that specific spectrum that is basically optimizing your crop before you turn that into a life bar and looking at that type of solution as well. And here are some of the different benefits of our Helio core system. So again, it's about really optimizing the both the control, looking at different light zone and groupings when it comes to uh, vertical farming. You can also, for example, do end of line treatments where you have one growth spectrum at the beginning of your growth facility or growth cycle, and then you end with a specific treatment to really reach those goals that you're looking for. For example, enhancing the red and lettuce. To divide, kind of developing this light spectrum, it takes, of course, um, sometimes the need of an expert to help out. Uh, and there comes our Helio Care system team. So we really have built our kind of foundation of the company on a deep knowledge about crop production, how LED lights are working together um, with the environment to optimize the plant growth. And by helping and using our team, you can help really achieve your goals, such as increase the yield or improve the quality but you can also get access to lab and different customized research projects that we have done. I'm gonna skip this and I know I'm a bit running out of time. So I'm just gonna end with looking at two different cases where we have used uh, our product and we have worked with our customers in different uh, vertical solutions to really optimize their growth facilities. So this is Uskorda and Uskorda is located in Sweden they are heavily focused on sustainable solutions. Uh, they want to have energy efficient solutions. They want to be carbon free. They're looking at really fine tuning uh, local production. And therefore the type of light and taste were extremely important for them. So here our Helio Care team worked together with Yuskoda to find the custom light spectrum to find a taste in Argula that were um, kind of mimicking what the Swedish population wants. Because when you're looking at taste, it's not just um, one taste fits all. 
But for example, in Sweden, we do not want our arugula to be too spicy, for example. So together with Yuskoda, we did taste tests um, to really fine tune uh, the spectrum that we were using uh, and did this with our Elixir solution. The results of that was that we accelerated their harvest with 19% after just adjusting some of our lighting strategies. But also we find that specific taste that uh, has really made a mark in the Swedish market for them. And they are now delivering a consistent and high quality 365 days a year crop production. We also worked with Nature Suite, for example, and this is another uh, case where before installation and before they bought the product, we actually worked on customizing product for um, their seedlings and kind of a good root development when it comes to um, grafting in, uh, in, in Mexico. So here we managed to conceive both a good root development overall, but we also reached the success rate, transferring all their um, uh, basically growth or vertical solutions from uh, traditional systems to an LED environment. And we still reached a 95.5 to 99.5 success rate doing so. Because I think it's, it's important to know also that it's not always easy to go to lead and find that optimum spectrum where you achieve what you want at the first time. Therefore, ongoing trials and tests is important um, and a deep conversation with the customer to understand what are they actually looking for. Well, thank you. Um, this was my presentation that I had. Um, and I'm, if you have any question, I'm happy to take that afterward. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for another informative presentation. Then we will move forward with Vegetech, and we have Bhaskar Rao and Hatim Morbiwala. So the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bhaskar, Chief Agronomy Officer at Vegetech. I just would like to give a small introduction of the company. Uh, Vegetech, in fact, is a startup. It's just a two-year-old agri-tech company, which is based out of uh, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, we work on a module of uh, build, operate, and transfer of farms, basically. And the module of transfer includes more of, uh, we give more stress on uh, knowledge transfer and skill development. Uh, apart from that, we do have a learning and a development and a grow academy uh, part of the whole uh, module. My colleague will be discussing in details. Um, the two major components of any indoor vertical uh, farm, apart from the HVAC, which are like grow lights and water bees, the grow lights are manufactured in our own factories in South Korea, and the water bees are manufactured in our own custom made factories back in India. So, uh, we everything that is on our indoor vertical farm is in house. Uh, regarding the area under cultivation, uh, as of now, in the UAE, in the Emirates, we have around 4,000 square meters of uh, cultivable indoor vertical farms, which is live. And uh, there are a few other projects in the pipeline, which will be completed by the first quarter of this year, which is in the other Emirates of the United Arab Emirates, like the Rasul Khaimah, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Sharjah which comes to around a thousand square meters, each of them. And we also do have an international reach back in India and other GCC countries and other Middle East countries. Uh, we would like to just play a small video now of uh, the Vegetech farms. Thank you. 
uh, if you want, I can share the video because the audio is not that good. And grow sustainable and environmental. My name is Heman, Heman Joka. I am the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder of Vegetech. We are solely here to disrupt the agriculture industry by bringing in technology so we can grow sustainable and environmental friendly farms that grow produce in the harsh climates of UAE. We are creating the harvest plan for farmers, which will focus on the nutrition, which is required to address two of the key issues in the UAE society today, which is childhood obesity and type two diabetes. The entire indoor vertical farm facility has been built for customers and they are operating it for them. Then you got the whole angle of innovation and research and development, where we are always constantly innovating. The farmer of the future, not only he'll be focusing on the plant physiology, but he'll also be looking at the environment because you're not talking about controlled environment agriculture. So they will actually start going a little bit horizontally. You bring in technology to create a positive social impact. Uh, that was a small uh, video. Uh, now, let me just uh, give you a brief of uh, the whole farms as such, which includes uh, all the three to four uh, systems of growing. We have uh, a slide here you can see is a harvest plant for this year, which includes organic produce. We have got uh, organic farms, we have got hydroponic produce in controlled environment greenhouses. And of course, we have the window vertical spaces. Um, we basically work on uh, farm KPIs. Uh, Vegetech is uh, aiming at farm KPIs. Apart from the productivity of the agronomist or the grower, we look at the quantity or the volume of water that has been utilized, how much water droplets have been gone to each and every production, the yields per square meter, and of course, the whole system whereby you give a sustainable solution to the whole population of uh, the United Arab Emirates and also the other, uh, other, other countries around. See, there are around a few farms which we have, and we have been uh, growing this from the last two years. We had had a production of uh, uh, 1.6 million tons earlier. Then we had added a few farms. So we are slowly growing up, and for this season, it's around 2.2 million tons of uh, vegetables, whereby we have a uh, hydroponic indoor vertical farm and etc. So there is a traditional uh, differentiation between uh, the farm KPIs, land requirement, water requirement, and pesticides. So which is around uh, five times more, and water requirements is 20 times more, which is uh, a well-known fact. And uh, it's a zero pesticide here in uh, when you compare it with. Uh, uh, with the traditional farms. And traditional farms work only for a few months of the year because it's a very uh, hot and uh, dry climate. So we, don't, we do not have uh, production in around four to five months of the year. But when we are doing this in the indoor vertical farms, we have, got, uh, done, uh, we have got the production for all the 12 months. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Bhaskar, for the information on, uh, on the agronomy end of things. So let me just start off by saying it's an absolute pleasure to be presenting here today with our colleagues in the industry and some of the work that I've seen is truly fantastic. So right now we were focusing on the veggie side of things and I'll be talking a bit on the tech end. So what you see in front, I'll be talking about the two, two ways. One is the VDOS, what we call the Vegetech Digital Operating System. And then I'll walk you through the Grow Cabin. So my name is Hatem Morbiwala. My background's in engineering and as a data analyst. Uh, and, I'll be, and I also head up the Grow Academy at Vegetech. So what you see in front of you is the Grow Operating Software that helps growers make decision on the ground, assist them with information that's light and important for the growing process. So as you can see here is the IoT, 
So currently, for those interested in the architecture, we use a unique architecture, which is completely wireless. And on the other end, we use the mod bus. So the architecture really depends on what type of farming we are looking at. As Vegitech, we provide farming as a service, F-A-A-S, farming as a service. So for the uh, for net houses, greenhouses, and open field organic farming, we used a LoRa network. But as we are inside the lab, and as you can see behind me is our research lab, uh, we are currently using a Modbus architecture. So that goes through the gateway through cloud computing, and that uh, eventually goes into the smart dashboards that give information live to our customers and our clients who we build and operate the farm from. So the reason. IoT actually is quite common in other industries. It's just been uh, taken a bit longer to, to come to the agriculture sector. Uh, IoT, we look at it from three angles. One of it is from incident management. So if there's some failure in the system, the IoT dashboard informs the, uh, the grower. Uh, second is from providing intelligence to the growers on what processes should be done when. And third, is an architecture that's custom built for Vegitech that focuses on research and uh, development. So the IoT stacks are completely different based on different parameters. The second part is the farm operation software, as you can see on the bottom half of the, the presentation. So the grow operating uh, software looks at it at a micro level, at a growing level, and the farm operating software looks at it at a macro level, uh, at a completely farm view. So through the farm ERP solutions that we have partnered up and uh, uh, co-created, uh, we develop crop plants. We can uh, do crop management, inventory management of your seeds and your nutrition. And you can do create sales invoice, do ROIs on crops, what works well, what doesn't work well, provide a complete stack for one-stop shop for all your farming needs. Uh, the second part of it, all the data that we create from our own research labs and the farms uh, is, is that data is quite important as it helps us make continuous improvements. So in terms of the data that we collect, uh, we work towards creating what we call a good model, a model for what does it mean to have a good and a productive farm. So we kind of uh, look at the inputs that go into the farming. We look at external factors uh, in control environment agriculture that's minimal. And then we try to correlate it and quantify it in terms of yield. So our focus for the longest time has been on yield, maximizing yield. But as you, as in the last presentation, as uh, Rebecca mentioned, now there's also a focus on nutrition and taste. It's a bit more difficult to quantify that, but, uh, but we are working on data models and rather creating ones that also go towards creating that. Okay. Can they hear me? Because the it's on view. Hello. Yeah. Uh, sorry, there are some technical issues. Um, right. So now I'll be focusing on the Pro Academy. So the Pro Academy is the the learning and development arm of Vegitech. Uh, so as a company, we have the goal to create the next billion farmers. Uh, so we have created products in the line that focus on consumers. So we have the Pro Kit that enables everybody to grow their own food. Uh, we have the Grow app that's available on the iOS and uh, Android store. And we have a knowledge platform, Talent LMS, where we create curriculum for people who want to get into growing food themselves. So as I mentioned, the goal of Grow Academy or the aim is to enable communities to solve real world problems using technology. Uh, so just to give you a context, last year between Jan and March, around 3000 students visited our farms. Uh, that was before the lockdowns. Uh, on the other end, this year we have created 
indoor vertical farms and greenhouses and two schools already uh, so with that we created something known as the urban grower program where teachers students and parents all come together right now online to learn about how to farm urban within their schools or within those farms that we created in the schools so that's the learning end of things on the other side is applied research as you saw in the video by our ceo uh, coo hemant in the recorded video that every developed countries have two major issues which is childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes so on the applied research side of things we have mou signed with seven universities across the world in south korea and in india and uae and europe where we are tackling these two issues for example with manipal academy's food nutrition and bioscience department we are looking at how can we fortify spinach and kale with folic acid and iron to delay the onset of these problems the other project that we find uh, that's especially close to me is the photobio reactor so we are working on uh, farming food grade algae with the led grow lights that we manufacture in south korea so currently we are growing hematococci hematococci is a type of an algae when stressed turns into astaxanthin and astaxanthin is used in cosmetics and also in cancer research because of its anti aging properties for example spirulina pound for pound has the most protein content so out of 10 grams of spirulina you can expect to get close to 7 to 8 grams of uh, protein so we are also working towards uh, farming food grade algae as we believe there's a shift towards plant based protein so right now beyond meat and impossible foods that are the leaders in this industry use peas and uh, soybean as a protein source but uh, uh, spirulina especially shows a lot of promise as an alternative so i'll be ending on this on the slide that you see in front of us uh, as a planet we create enough food for 10 billion people that's more than the population but unfortunately more than 20% of the people go to sleep hungry and we as a company are not okay with that so in the past there was a clear distinction between a grower and the people who lived in cities right now it's more of a consumer supply relationship where where the where the where we buy a produce from supermarkets disconnected with growers but in the future when we think about building smart cities when you look at where you will be getting your water from your energy from the infrastructure hospitals police stations whatever you build in terms of infrastructure and collection of data why not think where your food is going to come from so our goal is to connect the smart cities of the future with the smart farms of the future so the harvest plan will be driven by the demand and the requirement of the public so this is this is our goal for the future and with that uh, thank you so much for listening to our presentation we'll be happy to discuss these topics further in the q and a sessions thank you so much thank you so much for sharing vegetech's inspiring mission and we're going to see you at the q and a session uh, next stop, we have a pre-recorded presentation from Mark Juarez from Cell Semiconductor. I'm going to share the videos. Uh, Mark will be joining us for the Q&A session afterwards. Nakamura. Currently, I am a professor of University of California at Santa Barbara. I received Nobel Prize in Physics in 2014. I have been collaborating with Seoul Semiconductor and Seoul Biosis 
for joint R&D over 10 years. and I'm the Technical and Marketing Director for Zero Semiconductor Euro. We are a company that manufactures LEDs and we just joined uh, ABS, the Association for uh, Vertical Farming. So it's a pleasure to be here with all of you introducing our key technologies for horticulture. So I would like to explain a little bit uh, who is Zero Semiconductor. So we are a company from South Korea. We uh, were born 20 years ago. And today we are the number four in uh, the LED uh, manufacturers globally. And our aim is to become the number one in the coming years. Uh, we invest a lot in R&D and patents, and uh, we keep growing year after year. And uh, for us, it's very interesting, the horticulture movement, that the, there is this transition to the LED lighting in this last uh, few years. And here we can help a lot, uh, many of you, uh, in your uh, projects and developments of the light sources for the horticulture projects. Here, just uh, for you to have an idea of what we do, so Seoul Semiconductor is, uh, maybe not everybody knows this name, so we are not as famous as Samsung, that is North Korea, but uh, we are behind many of the products that you use uh, in, in daily, uh, for your car, for your uh, mobile phones, uh, uh, air purifiers, uh, lighting, so we are uh, in many applications and we provide uh, key technologies to the market. Let's talk about the horticulture. So the idea is that we show a little bit the market situation from our uh, LED maker point of view, the trends in the market, the effects of the light in the plants, that is, I think you will know more than me, and, and cell send in general. Uh, some cell semiconductor solutions on the LED side, what can we bring uh, to you? And what the expert says about our key technology, that it's called sunlight, where we can reproduce the sun spectrum. So about the market, uh, until now, is still dominated by uh, high pressure sodium, uh, the luminaries for supplementary light in the greenhouses, but we see a big boom in the um, US uh, market with the cannabis, where uh, Really, all the new installations are done with LEDs and especially white and red LEDs. So we expect the market will grow a lot, and in Europe there is a big, big movement right now. So until 2018, I would say that the main trend was the red and blue on the LED market to substitute the HPS with a high efficiency and uh, try to reach the level of HPS with uh, less energy. But what we see is that since uh, one, three years ago, the market started to change and moving to a more broader spectrum uh, and white LED solutions that are bringing a bit more easy way uh, for the growers also. Uh, and also reduce the cost. Uh, this is also very important. Yeah, basically what we can see is that if you have uh, white light instead of red and blue, you can also see much better if the plant has any disease or any problem. So that can benefit the, the growers. From our point of view, what we see right now is that there is a trend moving towards a more wide spectrum. And we see also that in the future, we will reproduce the sun. Because the sun is there uh, shaking the plants for millions of years. And now we can make it with LEDs very efficiently. So this is the trend we see today. Yeah, just talking about the cost. Also, we expect that the white uh, and red LED solutions can decrease uh, your uh, lighting and luminar cost a lot compared to blue and red. Talking about the effects of the plants, well, this you, you, as I mentioned, you may probably know more than us, 
but the main uh, thing here is that the quantity, the light quantity will give you more kilograms, the duration will give you the flowering, but very, very important is the spectrum of the light that will give you the quality of the, of the plants that you grow. If you give the plant a better spectrum, a more complete spectrum, for sure the plant will also grow better. Some discoveries that we have seen in the recent years are that the green light is also very important. Not uh, only blue and red, we also, there are some discoveries that uh, shows that the green light can go through the leaves and can uh, make the plant work more efficient. And that's why some uh, studies show that white LED light can grow uh, much better than blue and red at the same uh, micromoles per sure, micromoles per second, for example. Let's talk about cell semiconductor and what we can uh, do for all the growers. So we bring the LED solutions. In US, there is already a regulation talking about it. There is the DLC that gives some uh, efficiency and some lifetime. Most of our LEDs are complying with this. So if you want to sell in US, you can already do. And then let's start with the most efficient white LED solutions that we have in cell semi. First LED is the 50 56 volts but we can achieve 3.35 micromoles per joule. That this is really the, the highest we can achieve at uh, relative low carbon, yeah? 0.35 watts for a big die. This is a big chip, five millimeters by five millimeters, driven at uh, low current to have this low power and to achieve the highest efficiency in the market. Then we have the 3030C that it's uh, proved very successful uh, in many installations. So we already have many projects with this product and everybody is uh, very happy because it's very cost effective and very good efficiency, 3.1 microvolt. And uh, then for uh, people looking a bit more economic solutions but high efficiency, we have the 3528 uh, with 2.9 microvolts. This would be the, the white solutions. Then uh, here you can see our high power portfolio. So we also have blue, red, and others, but we mainly focus on the white. So the conductor is specialist on the white entities. Even we can do a broader range. I think where we are really strong is on the white area, UV, and uh, any other also. Then mid power portfolio. Here we also have many solutions, uh, single color. 30-30 with the sunlight solution, 50-50, So we have many, many different products that we are happy to, to discuss with you for your projects, different price, different efficiencies. And then we also provide uh, models. The yeah, model is just the LED board uh, with the connectors and the sophistication holes. And it's very easy for you to mount uh, the lumina. This is an example with the sunlight technology. Here you can see some installations done by our customers. So we don't compete with our customers. We don't do final installation. We just sell LEDs and models. And this is what you could do, the luminar maker or the farmer. Here is a success story with a German company or P1. And uh, they are selling this for home growers. So very successful, very easy design. And then uh, what the expert says about sunlight, because sunlight is our latest uh, technology, our greatest product, and we can reproduce the artificial sun with LEDs. So really, really amazing. So when testing the sunlight in the, the lab or some small, uh, small test, you immediately see the difference. So for the same amount of uh, micromoles uh, per, per meter per second, you see that with sunlight, the, the plants are growing much faster and much more plants, at least in, in this example we need. And uh, this is just due to the spectrum. Uh, so we are giving the plant the same as the sun. Uh, this is, uh, uh, well, the boys from the COR. Uh, we've been working with them. It's a research center in France, and they are testing always all the new LEDs, latest technologies, because they want to always have as close as, as the sun possible but inside the laboratory that they can make the genetic plants and test it before going to the field. And when they have seen the sunlight uh, some years ago, uh, it was uh, wonderful because they, they were uh, really excited and they like it a lot. And now the new laboratories are all equipped uh, with the sunlight uh, products. So really, really nice. Then uh, some tests done in Korea. 
when we grow uh, lettuce. And what we could see again is that for uh, 200 micromoles, uh, white LED, 80, 30, 30, or sunlight, is that with the sunlight we can achieve uh, more weight and more uh, nutrition. Yeah, so much better product at the end. What we said, the spectrum uh, is bringing you the quality in the product. And here another study from Wageningen where they test uh, fluorescent lamp, HPS, and uh, Sun, productive sun with channel, not, not the sunlight, but this would be similar to the sunlight spectrum. And uh, what they found is that if you don't have a uh, real sun, the fluorescence or the high pressure doesn't work. So why, why it was the high pressure? Because it's just to support the sun, right? To, to give this extra three, four, five hours when there is not enough sun, but you need the base of the sun, otherwise the plants are not very good. This was also very interesting report. And then we also cooperate with Eric Ranka from Michigan State University. And we, I would like to, to say this to, to all of you also, and we are open to cooperate with uh, any company to, to share the knowledge, to start new research projects with our key uh, technologies like sunlight or other LEDs, and uh, really prove that white LEDs are very, very good for optical. So do not hesitate to to contact and let's discuss about it. And then uh, here's some success stories from our customers of Yanda that they, they have uh, growers in Netherlands that they grow different kind of lettuce and with blue and red they always need to adjust it but with sunlight they don't need to adjust anything so all the plants uh, are looking as nature so it's really good and easy for them so they don't need to think about uh, light anymore. Then Econoke from Spain, that they grow like uh, nature, eco, so super bio. They don't want to change the spectrum of the sun or their uh, plants, but it happens sunlight. This is uh, from uh, Turkey, where they grow basil also under sunlight, and they are very happy for the results. This is a small startup from Poland, that they choose sunlight because they want to grow several plants and they don't want to have a mixing colors or different recipes for, for the different plants. So with sunlight, it's also straightforward. One LED covers all. Yeah. And this is the, the Colasse, the company that did these uh, floodlights for the Sinoa in France. So this is where, how they equip the new phytotrons, the growing channel. And this is another uh, good partner for us, Greenhouse Keeper from France also, that uh, they are equipping the INRAE laboratories in a combination of sunlight, UV, infrared, to really have the complete spectrum of the sun all with LEDs. This is really the most exciting for, for the researchers in the lab. So until here our presentation, I hope uh, we can find a point together where we can discuss about your projects and uh, so we can help you uh, to grow your plants uh, much healthier. So thanks for watching and in touch. Bye. Thank you so much, Mark. And we will be talking to Mark at the Q&A session. Next, we have a very short uh, video from our uh, member from Turkey, from Antalya, Farm Nova.
thank you also to Farmanova. Uh, and last but not least, we do have Francis Njuakom from Cameroon from CDVTA. And the floor is yours, Francis. Are you getting me now? Yes. Good. Um, thank you very much, Ramin. I want to thank Christine and Jewel uh, and the rest of the team at the v uh, AVF for giving us this unique opportunity to join this network of experts in vertical farming technology. My name is Francis Joachim, and I work for a local organization in Cameroon called Community Development Volunteers for Technical Assistance. Cameroon is located in West Central Africa, and it has uh, the French and the English speaking part. Actually, the country has a lot of natural resources in terms of gas, in terms of gas, um, agriculture in forms of coffee, cocoa, they grew a lot of other crops like potatoes, beans, maize, and a lot of other agricultural activities and vegetables. Today, I will be talking about uh, Um, ecosystems based Cameroon carried out by the CDVTA, and which is very interesting. I've learned a lot from the rest of other West African countries as a country's natural resources and agricultural system. We are beginning to look at also the socioeconomic challenges that are facing our country. And the first one, as we know, is migration. The second one is population growth. There is an increasing demand for fuel wood, expanding agricultural activities increased incidence of drought, poor food yields, high temperatures due to climate change, increasing deforestation, fragile ecosystems, bush fires, increasing low fertility, soil fertility, food insecurity, high youth unemployment, and water shortages. Now, all these things affect the environment, and this affects agriculture. So uh, when you look at the various socioeconomic challenges that face our agricultural system, you see that there are also problems of global warming and climate change uh, challenges. And so I'm going to look at what exactly is CDVTA doing in Cameroon. Now, CDVTA is a well-established charity uh, that has community development, resilient farming systems, eco-based uh, the adaptation and climate change actions at its heart. For over 22 years, CDVT has been promoting ecosystems based farming techniques and innovative climate smart vegetable and crop productions for improved rural and urban livelihoods preservation of the environment. Now, mm -hmm. CDVT's new strategy is to be able to partner with organizations like the Association for Vertical Farming. In the area of vertical farming, which is a new concept for us, honestly, I've learned a lot by looking at the enormous research, technology, and engineering that goes into vertical farming since I started listening to these hugely uh, enriching uh, technological presentations today. And so while we practice re resilient food systems, uh, adaptation to climate actions, to improve rural and urban farmers to turn agriculture, natural environments, and climate challenges into income opportunities to improve food security and alleviate poverty. We also see that these systems of agriculture in future with a lot of urbanization and population growth will mean that in order to protect the environment and promote our natural ecosystems, at the same time, protecting Agri uh, agricultural farmlands and ensuring that food, there's enough uh, food security, we must try as much as possible to take the populations out of the destruction of the forest areas in which they live so that they can engage home-based farming around their homes, improve on food security, improve on income earnings from agriculture, and at the same time, 
ensure that we can integrate various aspects of small sizable vertical farming technology into these activities for the foreseeable future. And so currently at the moment, CDJ is trying to work with the Association for Vertical Farming on an ambitious project which will seek to redesign agricultural best practices and food stability to improve on the lives of rural farmers in the English speaking part of Cameroon. It is also our intention that should this process of working succeed, we intend to cross over to the French speaking part of the country and implement the same system. Because when we look at the situation of vegetable growth as in the system of vertical farming technology, there are also other crops, for example, uh, food systems like banana, you have pineapple, you have uh, other things like cocoa and coffee, which actually needs a lot of agricultural land to be grown. Now, in Cameroon, for example, we continue to see that problems of agriculture are affecting climate and affecting global warming in the sense that a lot of forest is being kept down for agricultural activity, especially industrial agricultural activity like plantation farming. And so when they cut down vast amounts of forest in order maybe to plant palms that will in future produce oil, which is spread across in different continents, that affects climate change in negatively. It also affects our environment. And at the same time, it affects agriculture and a group of other plants that we need. So this project that we are looking at at the moment hopes to be able to alleviate poverty and food security by helping farmers to improve crop yields and maximize on their income profits, at the same time, protecting our natural environment. Now through this, we intend to be, we hope to be able to train and to improve skills for over 10,000 smallholder farmers who in the light of doing this will combat food security caused by natural disasters, climate change through improving knowledge on vertical farming, soil management and tree domestication. Now, I want, I would like to show you um, the next slide, which uh, Ramin will help me put together. This is actually how our climate gets affected, how there's global warming. If you look at the photograph um, on one side, you see before a forested area in the Northwest part of Cameroon. You look at the next photograph, which is after, this same forest area has been deforested by local population because they intend to use it for farming activities. Now, this is how our environment is affected. Now, when you go to, into the next picture, you see that in the work of CDVTA, in protecting our natural environment and ensuring that our ecosystems based adaptation is effective, CDVTA engages local populations in what we call innovative volunteerism and, innovate, and innovations that can build on climate resilience. What is innovative volunteerism? Innovative volunteerism is engaging uh, forest dwellers, people who live around forest areas, local chiefs who are the owners of the land and take decisions on farming in the forest areas so that they can volunteer and participate actively in the realization of forest pro protection programs. Otherwise, we also, when by, if they try to protect the environment, then they create and build climate resilience. In so doing, we take the population out of the forest areas and introduce them into alternative forest agricultural activities, which is like normal farming, vegetable production, crop production away from their homes. So these local populations are also encouraged and supported to champion tactical approaches and climate actions that prioritize the agricultural sector and clean energy meeting socioeconomic priorities of food systems and livelihoods while at the same time enhancing ecosystems and offsetting carbon to meet objectives, climate objectives across Cameroon and beyond. Now, to, to further preserve our natural ecosystems, CDVT trains youth and women as well as smallholder farmers on tree seedling development, tree planting, tree propagation, tree grafting, tree maggoting, protection of dry farmlands and forest regeneration in order to drive agroforestry. This area is complementary to waste recovery 
which also derives ecosystem benefits. Now, this is important. I want you to look at this particular photo that I have here. And this is how environmental destruction, like I said before, affects climate and increase of global warming, which eventually affects agricultural production and food security. Now, on this photograph is a, a, a mountain in Cameroon, which is spreading across the English and the French speaking part. They call it Mount Bambutus. This is like the third highest mountain in West Africa. And this mountain covers 20 villages with a population of about 30,000 inhabitants. Now, the inhabitants of this particular community and mountain, they depend on this mountain, the forest that used to be here. When you look at the photographs, you realize that a lot of trees have been cut down. So at the same time now, because the trees have been cut down, the area is dry, farming has been carried on for many years, this forest is completely disappearing. There's a lot of warming populations now are coming into build. For that reason, there is low fruit production. There are climate change negative effects on the environment. And at the same time, the population is going to a situation of food insecurity. And so to look at this, it's important that we can continue to engage our local populations, our women, our youth to participate in the protection of their own natural environment, to protect their own natural farmlands and to promote agricultural friendly activities as well as agroforestry that promotes, fights climate change, promote food security and also uh, help to protect our environment. Now we need to also be able to mobilize these same youths to transform their potentials into biofertilizers, into biogas, using the waste that comes from agriculture. And so my conclusion is to say that uh, climate change is affecting millions of people and threatening the efforts to escape poverty. In order to engage approaches and actions related to climate change, Closer attention must be paid to ecosystems-based adaptation technical approaches that provide flexible, cost-effective alternatives for reducing the impacts of climate change, hence combating threats that climate change pose to people's lives and livelihoods across the group. So why we look forward in CDVTN to learning more about vertical farming technology, like the huge innovative lessons I've learned from this wonderful team of today, we are like a baby as we look forward to jump starting our lives into learning from different aspects of vertical farming technology. Of course, through the network of the Association for Vertical Farming in order to ensure that we can effectively help to support in our own small way, the protection of the environment and the fight against climate change. I want to thank you again very much for giving me this opportunity to present today. Thank you to the AVF for kind actions. Thank you so much, Francis. And that concludes all of the presentations that we have today. And I'm going to give the floor to Joel Weister and the board of the association for the discussion and Q&A session. Thank you very much, Ramin. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm uh, Joel Coelho. I'm a professor of biosystems engineering at the University of Arizona, and I'm one of the vice chairs of ABF. So congratulations to all our presenters uh, this morning, uh, you know, not only in this uh, uh, portion here, but also in the first part. Uh, all of your presentations are really impressive, and each of the companies uh, that presented today uh, really is doing something really cutting edge, uh, which is really uh, quite exciting and, and really wonderful to know. I'll start with you, Rebecca, from Helio Spectra, since uh, you are our first presenter uh, for the second half. So you mentioned something exciting, and that is your company is providing uh, lighting for an installation in Antarctica. That's why you really have presence in seven continents on the planet. That's exciting. Are you at liberty to tell us which uh, uh, research station in Antarctica you're working with? Uh, yes, we are collaborating with the Eden Project um, in Antarctica. So we actually did uh, custom lightning uh, water-cooled LED lights for that specific research project, basically. 
and we've been working with them for a couple of years and it's uh i think it's exciting and it's um it's uh it's interesting to see how uh how you can survive in space the way that they are testing it in antarctica so it's it's a fun project to follow absolutely Absolutely, and uh, production uh, of food in uh, space, uh, you know, through a uh, bioregenerative space life support system really is uh, very crucial uh, for space missions and certainly uh, lighting for food production in such systems is really crucial. Uh, Another question for you is, um, do you and and, or how do you incorporate uh, energy optimization in your growing strategies? using well, our lighting systems? Well, I, what we see is there's a huge benefit for growers um, looking at LED lights already from start when they are planning their projects. Because looking at, I know a lot of people where we see are hesitant towards, for example, LED lights due to a higher cost in installation uh, in the beginning of a project. However, the fact, just the mere basically energy savings that you can do by installing an LED light instead of the traditional HPS fixtures, you are going to, throughout the year, basically save that money um, and make up that cost in just a few years. And looking at some of our markets, like in North America, where we see a lot of rebates from utility firms, for example, that comeback basically you can get back in just a year or two uh, because you can get rebates of up to almost 50% of your installation costs just for the mere fact that you're looking at energy efficient solutions and sustainable alternatives instead of light hungry solutions. So I think it's absolutely um, crucial. Uh, And I think that's one of the direct uh, kind of energy savings that we see is just the mere wattage that an LED light takes compared to an HPS. However, uh, we also see a lot of uh, kind of secondary uh, benefits of it. For example, LED light doesn't produce heat the same way. It doesn't evaporate the water the same way like traditional sources like HPS. So a lot of those customers are also saving on uh, kind of HVAC and unification processes. So that type of technology as well, both considering when they do the new installations, but also saving on costs if they do retrofits basically, because you don't have the same need for HVAC uh, as you do with okay. traditional systems. Um, All right, okay. So one last quick question for you is, uh, you've got this really wonderful uh, management uh, software tools like HelioCore. Do you provide them only to your clients or are they available to the public? So yeah, today um, they are connected to our lights, uh, but we are, uh, basically what we do is we have HelioCore, which is the top of line control system that we have with full functionality. But we do also have a a free version to do uh, basically a 24 hour um, light strategy in our lights and that is for free. So even if you are not looking to implement a bigger uh, control system like HeliCore, you still have the same uh, kind of, not the same level, but you do have the functionality to control to create light strategy and to make your own schedule throughout that day, basically. So, okay, and, and how do you call that uh, that tool? That's the that's Helio available Connect. For the yeah, I'm Helio sorry, Connect. Yeah. Helio Connect. Yes. Okay. So that is right. built in in our Elixir solution today. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. We appreciated your participation today. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy now to I'm going to move on to uh, Baskar and to Hatim from Vegetech. So Vegetech is, is quite admirable because uh, you're not only an innovation and technology provider, but you really are into knowledge transfer and skill development. And in fact, you have that uh, Grow Academy, which is really great. Um, Hatim, my question is for you. Uh, the uh, V Digital Operating System, uh, is that available to the public or are you keeping that uh, just to uh, clients and to yourself? Uh, for now, it's uh, the digital operating software is for our clients. So it's for the people we build farms. 
for pretty much but but uh, the software itself is completely open source so someone can measure how to assemble the whole setup uh, because we have kept it open source so 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 have we kept the cloud open source so that uh, information can easily be transferred so so at the moment it's open source but it's currently only for our plans because we have partnered up with for example for the iot solution iot solution where we used a mod bus setup with dell technologies so there's a whole all in one kind of solution that goes out uh, it would be much cheaper to take it through vegitech so we just provide the iot solutions as well with farm operation so we retrofit traditional farms with iot upgrades okay. to make right. good decision Thank you, Hatim. Uh, Baskar, I've got you. a quick question for you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, most of your uh, hardware technologies are in-house within Vegetech. Uh, you mentioned HVAC as well, but I wasn't clear. Is your HVAC in-house as well or tell us? Baskar, can you hear me? Yeah, sure, sure. I heard you. Yeah. Um... Hatchback is uh, basically we are, uh, what we do is like, uh, we get the components which are available locally. We are not fixing up with any sort of uh, uh, branded company. We uh, fine tune it as per the requirement of the client and the area where we are putting it up. So uh, except for uh, that, the rest of the things are in-house. Okay, apart great. From Hatchback, apart from Hatchback. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to move to uh, Seoul uh, Semiconductor with uh, Mark. Uh, Mark, that's a really interesting uh, technology that you are uh, working on. And uh, it seems that uh, while a lot of people in the industry, the vertical farming industry, have been sleeping, <laughs> there's been a switch <laughs> in terms of preference for lighting, uh, particularly LED lighting. And that is from the red and the blue combination toward the light LED. Uh, mm -hmm. And you mentioned that this kind of happened around 2019. So tell us, how did you uh, decipher and detect this uh, shift and, uh, and how? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And this is what we see from our customers at the end. Seoul is a global company and uh, we see a bit everywhere, no? a bit from US, from Europe, from uh, China or Asia. And uh, what we've seen is that in the past years, uh, mainly was blue and red. And uh, still, we can see a lot of these installations with blue and red for the um, uh, for, say, complementary light for the greenhouses in Netherlands, for example, because blue and red for them is OK. But there are many studies uh, going out also from Wageningen University. And we are also cooperating with some other universities that the white light uh, at the less micromoles can make you also grow the plant at the same speed. Yeah. So right. these are the things that will make a big change because there is a big pressure on the cost. As we right. discussed during the whole day, I think the main issue for the vertical farming to develop is the energy cost and the energy consumption. Right. So, yes, and, and, absolute, and absolutely the, the, uh, the cost of the white LED certainly is a big driver. Uh, exactly. for uh, really catalyzing this trend. Yeah, and, just, and so you've noticed that it's a, a global example. trend. Uh, an yeah. example is that um, blue and red LEDs are produced on millions of pieces, right? But white LEDs are produced on billions and nearly trillion pieces. So the scale is uh, really huge. I see. Huge gap. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So, so now with regard to uh, the white LEDs, you know, white light also, uh, I guess, depending on how you produce the white light, you could have, you could have different uh, spectral distribution. So just because it's white light doesn't mean that you have uniform red and blue ratios. And so the, the beauty of this is that uh, in producing the white LEDs, uh, there's still that opportunity to really design uh, the ratio of the blue and the red so that it can be designed to optimize the growth of specific crops. So are you at Seoul Semiconductor doing that in regard to designing your white light that is intended for vertical farming? Yeah, we have some good discussions uh, with uh, vertical uh, farming. Uh, manufacturers and luminar makers that are basically our uh, main customers and uh, we can do uh, 
uh, starting from the blue chip from Suji Nakamura, that was one of our consultants uh, for many years. And uh, then uh, using different kinds of phosphors that at the end, the price, there is no big difference uh, from one to another. So the main price on the LEDs is the chip. If you use a blue chip or red chip, you change a lot the price. But for the phosphor, it's quite similar. So we can take this uh, blue technology and make kind of variable spectrum adapted to vertical farming. This is the next step for us, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. That's really welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to move on to Farm Innova. Do we have Karim with us today? Karim, are you here? Unfortunately, or, I think he left, yeah. Okay, so we don't have any representative from Farm Innova. All right, then, and I'm going to switch to uh, uh, Francis uh, from Cameron CBVTA. Uh, Francis, um, we congratulate you for all these laudable programs that you are implementing in uh, uh, Cameron, uh, you know, in terms of uh, climate, uh, mitigate, climate change mitigation adaptation, empowering your local population, the women, the children. Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but, but as you know, uh, agriculture also is a business. Yeah. So how do you balance that? How do you balance your uh, initiatives in terms of uh, implementing and fostering sustainability with the profitability of the uh, enterprise, the agricultural enterprise? How do you link your projects with the market? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joel. Um, first of all, um, our farmers are trained to be able, first of all, when we provide them their inputs to support them to engage in environmentally friendly, climate smart, organic farming, yes. we ensure that they are trained on how to market their crops first from the local market and then from the surrounding urban and semi-urban markets. Now, when, when they market the crops, they are also trained to ensure that when they sell their produce, a, a part of the produce is kept as seeds for the following season. And then another part of the income is invested into groups of women and men's cooperatives. Now these cooperatives put their money together and it helps the rest of the group members to come back to the groups and lend money from these groups on small interest which they can either invest in the payment of school fees for their children, in the buying of more seats for the next season, or in the payment of medication for their families. Now we have created a network of farming groups across the English and the little bit of the French speaking part of Cameroon. Now this network helps the farmers to come together, to share experiences of their best practice, learn from their mistakes, learn from those who are doing well so that they can together be able to use what the new lessons they have learned and replicate in new communities. We yes. give them normally, when we engage in the community, we also let them understand that when formerly they farmed inside the forest area by cutting down the trees, they need to take themselves away from the forest area so that the forest is maintained, climate is controlled, global warming is controlled, but they should be able come back to their farms and ensure that they plant trees that can fertilize their soils continuously. They can also practice shifting cultivation as a means of sustainable farming. Now, one of the sustainability aspects of this farming system, Joel, is that we have a network of community committed volunteers. Yes. These are individuals who love their communities. They live in their communities. They speak the local language. They can communicate effective lessons to farmers. These people are there to help like pillars in ensuring that lessons are kept. They follow up the activities with the farmers. And so farmers work together with volunteers and our field extension workers to ensure that they apply cost-effective organic farming practices that are sustainable, but also that they make sure that they don't use any chemical fertilizers that destroy the environment and they get involved with the planting of trees. But yes, also yes. that they can network with other actors in the local area to ensure that their farming is sustainable, the environment is protected and the, 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 the food system is promoted. Yes, 
Francis, thank you so much. I mean, that is really very commendable in terms of what you're, what you're working out in Cameron. And one thing that I liked about your project is that um, you're, you're working with groups, with cooperatives, with farmers yes. associations, which is really key uh, because yes. it's important for uh, folks to uh, have enough scale that uh, they could uh, you know, pull their resources. And in their operation, they also could achieve some economy of scale, uh, which is really critical for this to succeed. So ABF is looking forward to cooperating with you in terms of uh, exploring uh, vertical farming, perhaps some low cost versions of uh, vertical farming that would be appropriate for uh, Cameron. And I don't know, maybe Vegetech with their Grow Academy would be interested as well in linking with, uh, uh, with Francis's uh, group here. So that's something that we could explore as well. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, do we have any questions from the gallery, from uh, our audience? Uh, I'm looking at the chat uh, box here, um, and we have to end soon, of course, in about three minutes. Okay, there is okay, there is one question here from Michael. And, yes. Okay, uh, there's a question here, and I guess this is directed to anyone. Are there any fresh produce which cannot be produced in-house? I suppose, meaning indoors. I haven't seen any fruits in the presentations. Anyone would like to uh, take up that question? Um, yeah, I can do that. I, okay. I think that from our experience, um, we grow strawberry in the house, chili, tomatoes, um, I think, uh, the problem there isn't the ability to grow indoors, but what we see is that due to the actual business case, a lot of growers in the beginning are looking to grow, for example, strawberries in house, uh, vertical. But when you look at the bigger business case, a lot of those growers are moving towards lettuce, for example, or microgreens, just due to the fact that it takes a shorter amount of time to grow it. So you basically can produce more cycles throughout the year doing that than you can do with fruits that take much longer time to grow, basically. So I think it's not the ability to do it, but it's the complete business case uh, that we see are, are changing for the growers. Okay, Rebecca, thank you. That's an excellent answer. Super. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just one oh, yeah. thing here. I, I would say here is, uh, very important also the kind of technology you will use because uh, from, for example, Eric Rankel from US, no, that he mentions about the spectrum that is the most important for the plant. So many of these uh, high quality crops or fruits, you will not be able to grow it with just normal LEDs or just normal HPS. So you need to reproduce the sun because the sun is the only thing we know it works for everything, right? So this is um, one of the focus of our company also to reproduce the sun. Then you can grow anything. Otherwise okay. you cannot. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, so here is one suggestion that I would like to offer to uh, our, uh, the companies that presented today and all the members of ABF. And I have yet to discuss this with uh, Christine and with Ramin because it just came up to me. It, it, it appears that uh, a number of the companies have very useful tools, uh, software tools that can be used by you know, anyone in the vertical farming industry, uh, such as with Urban Crop Solution with a calculator for uh, more or less uh, approximating the physical